science social it's a science social movement that's aimed at connecting scientists and the process of science with folks in the general public who are just curious and um, when i think about tonight's speaker it's really hard for me to think of someone who might be more curious and interesting than um, dr jill yeager and so um, Jill is a retired invertebrate zoologist. She was a professor at Antioch College for 18 years, and she studied a group of animals that we're actually not going to talk about tonight called remipedes, which are these amazing venomous invertebrates that occupy very dark spaces <laughs> under the sea. Um, Jill is going to chat with us tonight instead about bats and other creatures of the night sky. And um, just on a personal note, I would just share that I just, I've just i really just grown and appreciated getting to know Jill through the process of being a co-leader of the Asheville Science Tavern. We have a couple of speakers that will be coming up in the coming months. Next month is um, Dr. Meg Lohman, who is a canopy uh, rainforest plant ecologist um, who's based out of the University of Florida. And then following that, Allison Ormsby from our very own UNC Asheville is going to be talking about biocultural conservation and people's sacred relationships with forests. So if you like what you see tonight, we encourage you to come to future meetings. So, all right, Jill, take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Elisa, for that nice introduction. Um, first of all, everybody needs to understand I'm not a bat biologist. I got my interest in bats decades ago when my grandpa took me into my first cave and I saw a little tiny bat hanging on the wall and I just sort of fell in love with bats. And so that's basically my story. So if you have really technical questions, I may not be able to answer them, but here we go. They are clearly the creatures of the night sky. Oops, and let's make sure I can get going on this. Oh, oh no, hang on. There we go. So just a little bit of background for you, just a little biology lesson. Bats are mammals. They have body hair, they nourish their young with milk, and there's about 5,000 species of living mammals divided into about 26 orders. The pie of life, if you look at it, mostly invertebrates. And if you look down here, I don't, can you see my cursor? Okay, great. The mammals are this little teeny tiny part of the pie. So um, we're really in the kingdom of animals. We are just a blip in the world of invertebrates. So just a little perspective for you. There's three main types of mammals, and this will hopefully bring back some of your biology lessons. The monotremes are the primitive egg-laying mammals. The spiny echidna is one of these um, cute little animals. The second monotreme is the platypus that everybody knows about. And then the second kind of uh, mammal is a marsupial. And the marsupials are the pouched mammals. The young are born very immature. They crawl into the female's pouch and they wait there and they, they drink milk and they develop within the pouch until they're old enough to jump in and out. And almost all marsupial females have pouches. The third kind of mammal is a placental mammal. And these are the advanced mammals. And these are the mammals that have the young that are nourished through the placenta within the, within the female's womb. And mostly they're born pretty um, undeveloped. Although a lot of mammals, like for example, a moose will come out able to jump around, but a lot of these mammals are, are very undeveloped. And bats are one of them. This is a female bat in a whole huge colony of bats, which I'll get back to later. And bats are placental mammals. This is a good example. This is a little baby fruit fox drinking some milk from its mother. And this is a tiny little Mexican free-tailed bat. And you can see it's just on a finger, so you can see how small it is. Still not the smallest bat. I love this. This is a bunch of little orphaned fruit bats from Australia. Fruit bats are frequently killed. And uh, luckily, people will take the babies and raise them and let them loose again. But I just thought this was the cutest picture of these little bats. So what is a bat? A bat is in the order Chiroptera. And if you think about your Latin or Greek, if you go to a chiropractor, chiro is hand. And a pterodactyl, a P-T-E-R, terra, is the wing. So Chiroptera is a very well-named group for the bats. And some bat facts. There's over 1,200 species of bats, and you can think about how many mammals there are. Uh, that's a fourth of all mammals. So bats really are 
quite up there with them um, with the with the mammals. So bat wing bones, a thing about them, they're very similar to human finger bones, but they're more flexible. And this is a really good example of bat wing bones. Those are the fingers. We'll, I'll get to that in a second. There you can see a, a skeleton. It's got the long arm bones and then very, very long fingers. And then the membranes go between the fingers, uh, the fingers and then the, the, uh, the upper part of the bat. And the bat is the only flying mammal. Um, squirrels, the flying squirrels don't fly, they just glide. So this is the only true flying mammal. This picture shows the difference between, or shows a similarity, I should say, between the human arm and a bird wing and a bat wing. And you can see those very long extended fingers. But the same, same morphology that still has the humerus and the radius and the ulna, just that the fingers are very, very long. Here's the world's smallest mammal. It weighs less than a penny. It's called the bumblebee bat. I've never seen one, but I'd sure like to. That's the adult bumblebee, and that's the baby bumblebee. And it's, I think there's bumblebees that are bigger than that bumblebee bat. It's, it's so teeny. And this is the largest bat. These are fruit bats from basically Southeast Asia. That's where they're, they're found. They're huge. They're light. I mean, obviously she's holding it up, but, um, but they're, they have a wingspan of maybe five to six feet. There, it's it's a very big bat. So there's main categories of bats. There's the nectar sippers, the insect eaters, and the fruit eaters. And there's a couple other ones, but that those are the three that I'm going to talk about tonight. We'll start with uh, thinking about how many nectar sippers there are. About thirty percent of these bats will um, eat fruit or sip nectar. About seventy percent of all bats are insect eaters. And a few will eat frogs, reptiles, or fish, and only three species actually feed on blood. So looking at the nectar sippers, these guys are very important because they're the pollinators. And here's a perfect example of a nectar sipper. It has a very, very long tongue, and that tongue, it's going way down into the um, flower, and you can see what the flower's doing right here. It's flopping a whole bunch of pollen right on the head of that bat. So it's a good example of what we call co-evolution, where the flower has put its reward for the bat way down into that petal, into the petals, so that the bat has to put its head in, stick its tongue in, and then it gets zapped with pollen. This is another example of a, of a, of a uh, bat attracting plant. A lot of these pollinating bats are attracted to white. And so a lot of these flowers bloom at night and they're white and that helps attract the bats. And you can see this little guy has pollen all over him. Other example of co-evolution is the ca desert cactus. And you can see right here, it's got this fuzzy, fuzzy um, growth to it. And that deadens the sound that the bat makes so that when the bat is sending out its little beeps, it, it, it gets the impression of that flower and that flower comes back to them to him and so it goes right to the to the cactus so that sound deadening is a really good way to attract the bats they can just home right in on them and then those bats can spread pollen up to 30 miles nightly so bats play a huge role here's another great example of how the flower attracts the bat again it's a light colored flower the fl the bat comes up it hangs on to it and then as you can see right here, the flower just pops the pollen right onto the bat as the bat is grabbing on to try to get some nectar. So why are pollinators so important? Well, we have a lot of cultivated monocultures in the world today, and we need those wild varieties protected. So wild varieties of a lot of economically valuable crops rely on these bats for, for survival and for pollination. So if we want to maintain these ancestral stocks, which we do uh, because we want to keep that, uh, that genetic diversity available, you want those bats to help keep those wild, wild uh, plants available. So here's a really classic example of wild plants. There was a study done where they actually excluded the bats from the agave. And in case you want to know, agaves are where your tequila comes from. So they excluded the bats. And without those bats, the pollination dropped to one three thousandth of its normal amount of, of pollination success. 
So the agaves in the wild have to be um, protected. I mean, well, they need to be protected, but the bats also, because that keeps that um, strain of wild agaves available when, if you get an agave um, disease or anything like that. So anyway, uh, bats are really important for that. Just a few faces of some cute little nectar sippers, long tongues, um, fairly large eyes. They're not, bats are not blind, contrary to a lot of people. If you say blind as a bat, which I frequently do, you're, it's not really right. But here's a Mexican long-tailed bat. These long-tailed bats, um, I'm mean, long-tongued, excuse me, long-tongued bats, these, they're up to a third of their body length is how much their tongue can extend. And these guys are known for, if you put your hummingbird feeder out at night, full of food, ready for your hummingbirds in the morning, you get up in the morning and your hummingbird food is gone. It's because these long-tailed bats have the ability to stick their tongues right into your hummingbird feeder and they've learned to steal hummingbird food. So bat pollination occurs in more than 528 species of flowering plants. And if you know anything about the durian industry in Southeast Asia, that relies almost exclusively on um, bat pollination, the flying foxes. So they play a huge role in pollination. Here's just a few more examples of pollen all over these bats. The bats get, get, get attracted and they get popped with all that pollen. And this little guy has just, a, his fur is just covered in, in pollen. So why is this so important? It's because long range pollination is extremely important now because we're fragmenting our forests like crazy. And so some birds won't even fly across an open field, but bats will. And so they're, they're really important for long range pollination. So let's look now at the insect eating bats. Lots of those, 70% of all bats are insect eaters and they can eat from 600 to 1000 mosquitoes and other insects in an hour. So uh, clearly the one on the right, I really like because you can see what it's eating. Uh, and so, and, and mosquitoes too, but these, these also really can make a dent in the insect population. How do they do it? Well, their teeth are well-designed for crunching through the exoskeleton. So if you've ever stepped on an insect, um, you know that they have that really hard exoskeleton. So the teeth of these insectivores are really well designed to crunch that exoskeleton. So why are bats important for this? Bats eat corn borer moths and corn borer moths are the ones that uh, when they lay their eggs in the corn and the caterpillar hatches and then it's just a disaster for the corn crop. So Bats can save more than a billion dollars a year in crop damage around the world. So if you're a farmer or if you know people who have farms, you should encourage them to put up bat houses because that would lessen the amount of uh, herbicides and insecticides and, well, not herbicides, but insecticides that are needed. And that would make a big, a big difference, I think. So how do these insect eaters find their prey? It's echolocation. They send out a beep and then that that little beep comes back, it hits the target and that bounces back and they can tell right where their prey is. This is an example, you can see here, they, the bats will send out these clicks and it could be double clicks, all kinds of different clicks. And then it, those clicks come back to them and they know exactly how to get these insects. And I'm going to click on this right now and we're gonna hear a few bat clickers. We hope this will work. Yeah, come on. Okay. So the first bat that you're going to hear is called a pallid bat. And you can see that little echogram or spectrogram down below. All right, the next one is the big brown bat. That's a very common bat found around here. Okay, and now I'm going to go down here to the spotted bat, and <laughs> this is really amazing. This spotted bat, this, this noise that you're going to hear is what it makes, and it's very faintly audible. I cannot hear this. I'm going to click it up. I'm going to actually turn up my, my speaker, and um, hopefully somebody here can, will be able to hear it. I heard nothing. 
So here it is slowed way down 10 times slower. So those are those, those are bat calls. So let me see if I can get back to my talk here. Hang on. Oops, hang on, let me see. Okay. Um, I've got I've got something in my in the way that I can't get to this to to make it go down. Hold on, sorry about this. My mute button and all that stuff is up in the right hand corner and it's blocking my ability to get, let me go there, close it. Nope, that didn't do it either. Hang on, but slight technicality, let me try this. Ah, there we go. Okay, can you see that? Yep. Okay, thanks Harris. All right, so, if you want to detect bats, you can get a bat detector and you can go out and you can record all those recordings that we just heard. And it makes a really nice gift for people. Uh, if you want to give a really unusual gift, get a, get somebody a bat detector. They can go out at night and you can actually, by knowing the, type, the kind of beeping that each species does, you can tell which bats are flying around. So Another interesting example of this co-evolution is that the tiger moth is a, is a prey of the bat. They love tiger moths, but the tiger moth has found a way to avoid being eaten by bats. What they do is they jam that echolocation and um, they, can, they produce a whole bunch of these really clicks very, very fast and it actually jams the bat's echolocation. And um, that, can, that can let the, a lot of these little tiger moths live. It decreases the bat capture success rate. So I think that's pretty amazing that you have the predator and the prey, and there's always this back and forth going on between these two animals. Well, Bat Conservation International has this incredible bat monitoring program now where people go out, volunteers and um, people who work for, for bat conservation, uh, go out and they actually record bats all across the United States and North America, just to get an idea of where these bats are living and, and when they are, are there. Well, here's just some really cute examples of these bats. Uh, these are more of these insect eating bats, big eared bats, um, little eared bats, sort of yellow colored bats, all kinds of different bats. And if you wanna see some insectivorous bats, you need, only need to go down to Texas and specifically to, to the San Antonio area to Bracken Cave. Bracken Cave is home to a humongous colony of Mexican free tail bats. You can see why they're called free tail. They have this little mouse like tail coming down below or off, off of them. So, Bracken Cave is a nursery colony. It averages about four to even 500 um, pups per square foot. I mean, we're talking this cave is loaded with, with pups, bat pups, millions of these little pups squeaking and jostling around and crawling all over each other. And yet the mother has to come back to find her specific baby. And when it's um, nurse, nursery time, when it, when it turns into a nursery colony, there can be 15 million mothers looking for their babies in this cave, which just is incredible to me. So how do they find each other? Well, the, but, the, the, the pups and the mothers have very unique voices and they have a scent. And so when they get to really maybe within, the, the mothers know roughly where the, where the pups are in the cave. When they get close enough, then they can detect their own specific pup by its voice. And, and despite all these thousands and millions of these little baby bats flying around, or not flying, but wiggling around, uh, they find each other and the mothers can nurse and the pups grow up and everything is just fine. So this is an example of Bracken Cave. It's a fantastic natural phenomenon. If you ever get down to central Texas, you should go to Bracken Cave because these bats, these millions of bats, takes it takes hours for them to leave the cave. They just fly out by, well, you can see there, it's, it's incredible. So that leads to the topic of bat guano. 
So where you have a lot of bats in a cave, you have a lot of bat guano. The bat guano is extremely rich in nutrients and bacteria, and it's been used as a fertilizer. It still uses a fertilizer today in many parts of the world. And during the Civil War, it was a, an ingredient in gunpowder. So th this is an astonishing amount. From 1903 to 1923, at least 100,000 tons of bat guano were taken from just one cave and sold to fruit growers in California. To me, I wish they were still doing that because think how much you could save on fertilizer uh, and there, we wouldn't have quite so much um, pollution of our waterways if we could use natural fertilizer. And in Texas during the 1800s, bat guano was the largest mineral before they discovered oil. So it, bat guano has played a huge role. Um, and now it's mostly used in uh, Southeast, Southeastern Asia by, by people there. Not too many people uh, have bat guano, although I think you can buy bat guano from certain uh, nursery places, shops, maybe even on Amazon. I haven't looked, but anyway. So each free tail cave though, this is what's so amazing is it's a huge treasure trove for biotechnology because the bat guano contains amazing amounts of bacterial species. Uh, and a lot of these species are only found in caves. And so you know that we're having problems with antibiotics. Um, we're becoming resistant to antibiotics and things like that. And so um, a lot of these caves are being looked at, these, these microbes are being looked at like crazy to see if we can find more ways that we can um, look at um, medicines. So it's, a, it's really good for biotechnology. Well, back to Texas again, if you ever get to Austin, a fantastic city, you have to go to the Austin, to the, to the Congress Avenue bridge because living under that bridge just by design of the bridge, it was sort of a fluke. It wasn't done on purpose. The, it's, it was, it's perfect for these bats to go in and roost. And it's the largest colony of urban, or the largest urban colony of bats in the world. And you can see that you've got people on the bridge just watching the bats fly out. There are coffee shops all around. There's probably pubs too, where you can just sit next to the bridge and watch these bats come and go which I think is really amazing. And Austin welcomes people to that too, which is, it's a, it's a real draw for a, a lot of tourists. Well, now thinking of all these bats, I have to talk about Pseudogymnoascus destructans. And with a name like Destructs, destructans, you may wonder what that is. Well, here's the problem. If you see that cute little bat and that little white nose, this is called white nose syndrome. It, the, it's the, the um, bacteria is, or the fungus, excuse me, is causing that white nose. And this white nose cyst syndrome has killed more than 6 million bats since it was discovered in 2006 in one cave. So since 2006, more than 6 million bats have died, mostly insectivorous bats, which means there's a lot of uh, insects now that could have been eaten by the bats. Why is this fungus a problem? Well, if the fungus attacks the bats, and starts living on the bats, that these little hibernated bats wake up more often while they're hibernating. And anytime a hibernating animal wakes up, what happens? They're using up their stored fat reserves. And a lot of them will actually fly out of the cave. They fly out, it's winter, there's no insects, there's nothing to eat. They'll freeze to death or starve to death and they can't, or they won't get back into the cave in time. It's, it's really sad. <clears throat> Here's some examples of that white nose syndrome. Well, where is it now? Since it left one cave in 2006, it's all over the United States now and uh, Canada. It's probably down into Mexico by now too, but it's ma mainly here in North America. White nose syndrome is found in European bats, but they seem to be resistant to them. So we're hoping that maybe our bats will start to become more resistant to them and, and populations will start to grow, but it's a very serious problem right now. And there's no, there's no way to treat them uh, at the moment. There's, there's no treatment for white nose syndrome. So if you think about 1 million, just 1 million bats dying from this disease, that means a huge amount of insects are no longer being eaten in, in a year. And so um, that's, that's not good either. I'm, I'm really one of these people who really am against using insecticides and herbicides and all of these biocides. I think we need to try to think of things a little more naturally. Well, the third kind of bat. 
fruit bats. And these are important because these guys are the seed dispersers. Here's an example of a fruit bat just hanging around. They're big, nice big eyes. They look like little foxes, little flying foxes sometimes. Here's a couple of captive bats um, that have been kept held in captivity or they're, or they're in zoos. I forget where this, these photos came from, but um, they're just uh, very happy to eat fruit. But what you can see, oh, there's a whole bunch of fruit bats right there. There's over 3,000 plant species that depend on bats for seed dispersal. And that's really important that, that the bat plays these roles. This is a Jamaican fruit eating bat. It eats figs and a lot of other tropical forest fruits. And again, when they eat these um, fruits, they fly and then they'll, they'll um, defecate out the seeds and that really helps with seed dispersal. So the flying fox has been uh, shot and killed in, in uh, Southeast Asia a lot for a number of reasons by fruit growers because they think that the bats are eating their fruit. But anybody who's ever gone to the store to buy a mango, you never get a good ripe mango. Why? Because they pick them green. So, and then, and then you keep it in your kitchen until you hope it finally gets edible, which mine never seem to get edible. Um, but anyway, what I'm getting at with this is that the people who grow these fruits pick the fruit green. Bats are not going to eat green fruit. If you have a, a picker who comes and they miss a few fruits, then the bats will go in and they'll eat the ripe fruit, but they're not, they're not decimating fruit growers produce. So that's one thing I wanted you all to see that you don't, they're not eating these green fruits. So seed dispersal, again, they really help restore logged forests in the tropics. We were talking about pollination and forest gaps. If you have gaps in the forest and, and we are fragmenting our forests like crazy, bats will fly across a fragmented area and they will drop those seeds, which really does help restore a lot of these logged forests. Okay, the other kind of bat, and I'm sure you're waiting for this because it's nearly Halloween and you need to know your vampire bat facts here, folks. So vampire bats, how does it feed on its victim? And they're, they're just as cute as other bats, I think, um, but they have teeth that are, as you can see right here, are very, very sharp. They're like little razor blades and they're well designed to uh, break the skin of their, of their victim. So do bats suck blood? Vampire bats do not suck blood. They're very light, they're very stealthy. They'll fly down, and example here, they're eating, they're, they're drinking blood from a pig. They'll fly down, they'll land next to the pig very quietly, they'll crawl over, they'll crawl up the pig's leg, and they'll get to a place where they think there's a good chance of getting blood. They use that razor sharp tooth to just make a little slit in the, in the skin and then they'll drink the blood like a little kitty laps up milk. They don't suck it, they just lick it up when it starts to ooze out. And what's interesting is that their saliva has an anticoagulation aspect to it. And so the blood keeps flowing, they keep licking and, and um, everything's just fine. Except when you have a bunch of um, vampire bats living near your herd of cattle. And when you've got people growing, cutting down the rainforest to grow cattle to eat your churrascarias in Brazil and other places, um, what happens is the bats have a really easy target. So they'll go and they'll start drinking the blood of the, all the cattle. Well, that's not so bad because cattle have enough blood to share with bats, but it's leaving little holes in the cattle and they're in the tropics. And so the cattle get, <clears throat> excuse me, they get diseases and they get bacteria entering these little holes. So that's not good, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so interesting thing about vampire bats, if you have a small group of vampire bats living together and they frequently do, it's a, a little, little colonies of females, They'll share their blood. They're very altruistic. They'll share their blood with each other if one of them didn't get successfully uh, able to feed that night. And they'll actually regurgitate some of their blood to feed the hungry friend, which I think is really nice. So if you think of a, a vampire bat, they're not, they're not all bad. Uh, they're, very, they're very nice to each other. So one of the, the other group of miscellaneous bat categories of the ones that eat 
fish or reptiles or whatever. This is called the fringe lipped bat. And I just found this photo. I had no idea that this bat even existed. This little guy eats small amphibians and reptiles and it'll even eat birds, but it's especially adapted to eat toxic frogs. And they're not sure, but they think maybe those little bumps all over its face may play a role in this toxic diet. They don't know what yet, um, but it's it's one of these that falls into the miscellaneous bat category. So I'm sure you're all thinking about bats and diseases. So I thought I'd throw this in there. Bats do have rabies viruses. They are vectors, but there's, they seldom ever contract the rabies themselves. And only about 1% of all of bats have this rabies virus. And 99% of the rabies cases in the United States come from dogs. But I have to tell you, if you are ever bitten by a bat, if you can't catch that bat and have it checked, you're gonna to have to go through rabies, uh, the rabies shots because you'll die. Um, and there's no way to know if the bat has rabies or not. So if a bat happens to fly in your house and accidentally bites you, which it, it would be accidentally, they're not looking to bite you, uh, try to catch it because you're going to have to have it uh, taken care of to see if it does have rabies. Um, when I was at Antioch, frequently people would find bats that would wake up from hibernation when it got really warm. And so I would have to go get the bat and I'd keep it in, I put it in a plastic or in a styrofoam box and keep it in the refrigerator at about 45 degrees and put it back into hibernation. And then once a month, I'd have to pull it out and give it some mealworms and some water and then put it back into hibernation. Well, one of my students was feeding a bat one day and the bat was so hungry, it was so excited that it jumped up and it bit her on the hand trying to get the mealworm. So unfortunately, we had to send that bat to the Ohio State um, Disease Control. I think that's where it went. And they checked it. And luckily it didn't have rabies or she would have had to go through the whole rabies series. But so just be careful, don't handle bats. If you see a bat on the ground, just leave it. Uh, and um, yeah, but, but you know, if you have bats in your house, in your roof or anything like that, be nice to them, let them stay there because they're gonna eat a lot of insects. Okay, COVID. We all know that people have been blaming bats for COVID. Um, and bats do carry a lot of COVID viruses. No, not necessarily the bats in the United States or North America, but bats in Asia have been found to have the coronaviruses in their, in their system. But as of today, I tried to look at this very carefully. There's really no consensual scientific studies right now that has a direct connection between bats and the, and the SARS virus that causes COVID that we're all catching. Uh, and some studies think that there might be some sort of an intermediate host um, that we don't know what that is for sure. But there's still talk about um, did that virus come from bats? How did, how did the bat, how did the virus jump from the bat to humans? People think maybe from eating bats, which they still do sadly in some parts of the world or keeping bats in cages in these markets. There's really no way to know yet what's going on with this COVID. Um, but one of the things I can guarantee is that we are destroying habitats and we're, we're exploiting wildlife. And this is causing a lot of new pathogens to jump into the human population. Uh, we've got Ebola, for example, that's blamed on animals, I think. Uh, but we have a lot of these pathogens that are just waiting there. And right now, all of our um, tundra is thawing and who knows what kind of viruses are, are in this, these, um, the frozen tundra, uh, not tundra, I'm think, not thinking the, quite of the right word, but anyway, permafrost, that's it. When the permafrost is melting, there's a whole bunch of viruses and bacteria that have been locked in for eons. And so what's gonna happen, we don't know, but. The thing to think about is that when you were, we're destroying habitat and we're taking animals out of the wild, there's a really good risk that these pathogens are gonna jump to human population. But we have lived alongside bats now for centuries. I mean, people have been going into caves and gathering guano and visiting caves and having no problem whatsoever. So the main role of that is, or the, the story is that we are healthier and we are safer when we conserve wildlife and their natural habitats. So 
back to the COVID virus. This is very interesting. Bats may hold the key to the next breakthrough vaccine or treatment because they have this unique ability to tolerate these viruses. They have the viruses, but that doesn't mean that they themselves are contracting the diseases. They're just a vector. So how are they able to live without uh, getting the virus, but yet transmitting it? So they're really good models to understand how, how to deal with these viral infections. And believe me, we're gonna have more. Uh, so condemning bats really is, is a mistake in, in my mind. So here's some faces of bats, just a couple of photos of some, some bats that are so unique. There's just an amazing variety of them. They're cute, I think, most of them. Uh, this is a cute little spotted bat. These are my favorite bats of all. These are Honduran white tent bats. They look like little white pigs with little noses and little yellow ears. They're so cute. And what they do is they call them a tent bat because they'll, they will fly underneath a great big huge uh, uh, vegetation, a great big huge plant. I can't think of the name of these plants. And they'll chew right along the vein and then the, the plant will go like this. And so then the bats have a little home. And if they're, since they're in the rainforest, they can stay dry at night when they're all gathered together. So these tent bats are just, they're just so cute. My, my favorite bat. So here's a little punk bat for you. And I, I think it, if you like bats and you're concerned about um, having no mosquitoes around your house and you wanna really help bats, the thing to do would be to put up a bat house. So not only does a bat detector make a good gift, a bat house makes a really good gift too. So we've got holidays coming up, you've got birthdays, you've got weddings, give somebody a bat house for a wedding present. Uh, demonstrate your commitment to, to nature and, and these little bat tenants will pay you back by giving you lots of, uh, well not lots, but putting some guano on your deck maybe and you can put it in your garden, but mainly eating the insects that are all around your house. It's not easy to get them to come in. You have to have a few tricks and, and Bat Conservation International has a lot of information about bat houses. And that's what I'd like to say is um, Bat Conservation International is a wonderful organization. This would be another good gift to give somebody just a subscription to their, um, to their nice little newsletter that they put out. So think about joining Bat Conservation International. It's a, it's a wonderful international uh, group of people that really tries to preserve and protect bats around the world. So basically the future of bat conservation is in our hands. And I hope that you think that when you see a bat now, at, especially around Halloween, that you'll think a little bit more kindly about them and you'll have a little more knowledge about these wonderful little creatures. And with that, I'd like to say happy Halloween from the Asheville Science Tavern. Thank you. If we have any questions, please put them in the chat. But remember, I'm not a biologist, a bat biologist. But I'll try. Thanks, Jill. Oh, you're First, welcome. Do you want to field some of the questions that have been in the chat? Yeah. And of course, I guess I'll start with myself because uh, I was the first one to put a question out there. But um, so, Jill, do you know how effective bats are compared to as pollinators compared to insects or birds? Specifically, no. I mean, what percentage of bats pollinates versus insects and birds? No, but they're right up there with them. But, it, but, but it's really specific. I mean, they only will pollinate specific plants. So I would say, obviously, insects and birds are a little more general. They're more generalists. Okay. Because uh, obviously, okay. you think about that, bats come out at night and not all the, the flowers bloom at night, but all the night blooming flowers are blooming for either a night moth or, or the bats, so. Right, um, and then another part of the question was, so those, those specific flowers, you know, you said that they were white colored, have those been studied at all in UV wavelengths? Cause you know, they have the new night vision technology for yeah. cameras and all that stuff now. So I was wondering if, you know, maybe the bat vision can see in UV or what Ooh. the deal is with that. That's really a good, Good thought. Uh, I don't. I don't know of any studies that have done that. But then I haven't looked at that, Harris. I, I should look at that. I do know that a lot of those desert cacti have that fuzzy stuff to help them. You know, help help the bats home it right in on that flower. So I don't know. Good question. Okay. 
Well, we'll get to some other people's questions now. Um, let's see. Got one from Elisa. Where do people think that the fungus came from in reference to the white nose? Well, if I had to say this, and if there's cavers listening, they'll probably hate me, but obviously if you've got the white nose syndrome in Europe and it was in a, one specific cave in New York, I can only think that maybe cavers brought it who were caving in Europe didn't know they had the spores or whatever, the fungal spores on their boots or their clothes or whatever, and they might have contaminated the cave. That's just an if, because bats are not flying from Europe over to the United States, but it's, pro it's probably human cause, but there's no set evidence. So any caver out there, sorry, but I tend to think that we're spreading it by caving, but I have to say that the caving community is really, really watching this because if you are a caver and you're going into a cave, you have to, you basically, when you go to these caving conventions, there are huge areas where you sterilize your clothes after you've been in a cave. So we're very conscious about spreading uh, white nose syndrome, but it's a little too late. So, but we're still trying to prevent it. Uh, thank you. And then another kind of fungus question was from Chris is why is the fungus not in Florida? Well, it's a, so for now it's a cold loving fungus. Uh, if the fungus starts evolving and, and starts to, you know, move its way down on, now I notice that there's some that they have found in caves in Texas. Caves in Texas are warmer than caves in New York. So it could be that the fungus itself is, is evolving. So yeah, but it's supposed to be only a cold, cold loving fungus, but it could be evolving too. Thank you. Um, another question from Elisa is, how big is the fruit fox? The mango pit is giant. Yeah, the <laughs> those, those, those guys are big. I mean, they have a wingspan of at least six feet. And yeah, they're, they're a big, they're a big bat. So they can have no trouble eating a mango. Well, but with the mango, they, they mainly, may, mainly only eat the fruit. I don't know that they disperse a mango seed. That's a good question. Although their seed dispersals, I mean, they disperse. Yeah, that's a good question. It'd have to be a darn big fruit bat. <laughs> Great, thank you. And then a question from Stephen. Um, do all bats hang upside down and why do they hang that way? Do they have differences in their internal structure to adapt to being in an inverted position? Yes, absolutely they do. Well, first of all, because they're flying mammals, well, birds fly, but, and they can hop around on their legs, but bats can't, they just, their legs are not strong enough. They're not designed to, to, to hold weight. So it, it's logical that they just hang upside down. Their internal anatomy, I don't know the specifics, but yes, it's sort of like a giraffe in its long neck. It has ways of keeping the blood from running to its head and all that. So they've got to have some kind of physiological adaptation to, to hang it upside down, but I don't know. I can't answer the question specifically. But if you, see, if you see a bat on the ground, it, it, it can't do anything but just kind of crawl. It uses its wings and, and its feet a little bit to grasp, but it, 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 there's no way a bat can stand up, not even a, a fruit bat with big, huge legs. But that's why you see their claws. They have really good claws. And just a reminder, Jill is not a bat biologist. Thank you. <laughs> I am not a bat biologist. I just love bats. Um, As you can tell. Here's another question from Denise. What kind of bat ears are you wearing? What kind of bat ears am I wearing? Hi, Denise. Um, Aptesicus. That's my guess. These are big brown bat ears. <laughs> I don't know. They're just bat ears. Good guess. Yeah. So we've got another question from Megan. Oh, Megan. Hi, Megan. Bats to see in the dark. Say that one more time, I'm sorry. Uh, what allows bats to see in the dark? Well, the, okay, first of all, their eyes work just fine, but when they're flying around at night, they, they still use their eyes um, to, to avoid buildings and stuff like that. But, but what they do the most is they're using that 
echolocation to find their prey. So bats can fly around in the dark without any problem. In fact, I've been in a cave with millions, it seemed like millions, I should say, thousands of bats flying around me and they were, they were just all around me and they never, I mean, I could feel them going past me. They never hit me once. So in absolute darkness, and it was pitch black dark in that cave, that echolocation works beautifully. So they are, they do use their eyes, especially fruit bats. They have eyes that work real well. And the insectivorous bats, they can still see, but they just use that echolocation to find their insects. Hope that answered that question. All right, thank you. Um, the next question we've got is from somebody called Good. Um, is there a geological history of larger bats, so bigger than fruit bats? I don't know. I can't answer that one. I don't know about the fossil record for bats. I can't, I, that's a good one for me to look up for my next bat talk. I don't know. Everybody stay tuned for bat talk 2.0. <laughs> yes, it's a good question. Um, and then another question from Elisa is, uh, we think a lot about how bats impact non-cave ecosystems, like in the example of mangoes, but what roles do bats play in cave ecosystems slash ecological communities? Excellent question. I should have touched on that one too, because of the bat guano. The bat guano, if, if, if you ever get to see David Attenborough's Planet Earth series about caves, and you should all watch it, Google it or go on YouTube or however you get it, they're, they're, they filmed this pile of bat guano and that bat guano is teeming with life. I mean, there are cockroaches and millipedes. So there are all kinds of cave adapted invertebrates that live on, this, on these guano piles. So it plays a huge role in the biology of the cave because the guano is the basis for these invertebrates, which then get fed on by higher up animals, such as cave salamanders. And depending on where the bats roost, if they roost over water, then that guano goes into the water and that's a source of nutrients for uh, organisms in the water. Or if they're fruit bats that are hanging in a cave and, and they defecate out little seeds, then there I've seen um, fish eating the seeds that the, that the bats drop. So they play a big role in, in caves. Great, thank you. Good questions, excellent questions. Um, and then we've got a question from Eden. Uh, Jill, what kind of biologist are you? <laughs> I'm a retired one. <laughs> um, I used to work, well, my degree, my PhD was in ecology and I just, fell into cave diving and discovering the invertebrates that live in caves. And so basically I've been studying these little animals called rimipedes uh, most of my career. So that's it. So I would say I'm a, I'm a zoologist slash ecologist slash invertebrate zoologist, rimipedologist, something, I don't know. A new category. Yes, exactly. Okay, well, uh, we'll open up the floor. If you guys have any questions, you can either unmute yourselves or raise a hand with the reactions tab. I wanna see who all's here. Let's see who all's here that I might know. Hey, um, Jill. Hey, who's that? Sam. Hi, New Sam. Back. Oh my gosh. Excuse oh. me, Wall. Here's one of my roommates from Colorado State University undergraduate. Oh, let's, let's not think back that far. <laughs> let's, let's not worry about how long ago that was yeah that was too long ago that's for sure i hear jill. oh somebody else is saying jill oh my gosh in our in my parking lot right outside of my condo <laughs> i can't believe it all right wonderful so it, this is so this is so much fun i i love this zooming i have to see who else is on and i'm sure if you guys are wanting to click off just go right ahead i see glenn taylor i don't know whether my whether my little niece joan is still here my sister ken steiner from burn indiana margo from california a wonderful fabulous like a what do i want to say she's like my daughter-in-law who else lots of people anyway thank you oh, all for being here so who else is saying hello Jerry. Jerry. Oh, hi, Jerry. There's another friend. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions about bats? Because 
we should probably hang up here. Um, a quick announcement as well. Also, if you want to revisit the talk or any of our other talks, we do have a YouTube channel. So this, along with the other ones, will be up on the YouTube channel. Um, and I'm going to post a, the link is on our meetup page. I'll also copy and paste the link into the chat box. If you want to go ahead and click on it right now, see that good link to the uh, article about fossil records. So uh, yeah, if you want to see our videos on other topics or in the future, uh, we'll also be posting all of our future presentations while we're still remote on there. So thank you and all I for think, coming on. I, I think the cave diving uh, talk that I did is on there too, uh, yeah. back. So if anybody wants to learn about these rimmer beads, you can do that too. So anyway, all right. Well, thanks everybody for being here. Appreciate it. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joe. Bye. Good one. Bye. Thank you, Thanks, everyone. California. Hello, California. Bye. 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 Bye.